can. So oh, I will jaga. Thank you. Hello. Hey. Hello. I'm sorry, how do I pronounce your name? How are you guys? Good, good. So I have a question, how do I pronounce your name? <laughs> oh, Miguel. Miguel. That's okay. Okay. Thank you. Actually, I, I worked with Prima before. Yeah, he told me. He told me that yeah. we guys worked together. He was the he was the teacher at General Assembly. Oh, you went to General I, Assembly? No, I, I I wasn't a student. I was a TA for like. Ah, very nice. <laughs> yeah, so I knew him, and then the, uh, yeah. Then when I saw like you putting his name beside it, they're like, oh, it's him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got some talent from GA. <laughs> uh, what do you are you a teacher uh, instructor at the wagon too i teach sometimes but i'm the product manager ah uh, i see and prima was gonna come today as well to tag along with me during the presentation but it, he had something urgent and he cannot make it so i'm alone unfortunately i see oh i'm curious uh, the wagon is a teaching school right yeah. Then, like, what do you do as a product manager? So, I there's a number of things that I need to do. Like, the, the role of a product manager for us, it's a little bit broader, but it's uh, going to events, building partnerships, trying to make sure that there's features on the roadmap that are reflected on, on the platform that we use internally. Mm. Also, there's a strong product marketing side, that kind of stuff. I see, I see. Also, oh, you take care of partnerships also. Yeah. Oh, interesting. And you, you are a developer yourself? I, I w wouldn't call myself like a full-time, super strong developer. I know how to get around. I, I, did, I did some work freelancing for about two years and a half. The... But I wouldn't say like I'm a senior developer, super good. Like I, I know some stuff. And there's way more than I don't know that I know. That's for sure. I see. Cool, cool. And the wagon is, uh, is in Singapore, right? Yeah. The school? Is it only in Singapore? We're in Asia, we're in Singapore and in Bali. Mm. Mm. I see. How, how are the students doing? Super good. Super good. <laughs> um, here in Singapore, we started like two, three batches ago. And this last batch was super strong, people like really good people, very strong at coding and also very passionate about it. Uh, most of them have found roles already. It's, mm. Yeah, so it's, it's very rewarding. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I, I, I will assume that most of your students will also be mid-career change kind of people. Kind of, yeah. Like We have three kinds of people. Like We have people who are entrepreneurs and they don't want a career change what they want is to build their own thing mm -hmm. and either as their own small project or they want to they want to build it with other developers we have career changers and we also have lots of young grads who want to go into tech ah oh, okay okay yeah back, back back when i was helping working with prima at ga most of the people are like I, yeah. Now that you reminded me, there there are some entrepreneurs, uh, but most of them then was uh, was mid career change, like people who want to go into tech. Mm. Yeah, it was super cool seeing all these people it's like nice. working to. It's an entirely different industry for them, so I I found it super cool. <laughs> yeah. And you, you are you working as a developer right now, or what, what's your full time occupation? Yeah, I'm a developer. I work. I'm working at Shopify. Ah, nice, man. I mean, I it's. I hope it's. It, is it as good as it looks from the outside? 
Uh, I've, I've listened to interviews to the CEO, uh, to big people in Shopify and just the culture, the way they talk about their product, the way they talk about how they want to understand technology and how they want to build platforms is just fascinating. And I was like, yeah. is it really that good inside? It is, it is. Man. As in, from my personal experience, it is. Uh, they really live up to what they preach. That's awesome. So, sometimes it's a bit unreal, like to the extent of things that they do and they really living up to what they say uh, but it was it's super cool like even I, I've been there for seven months but it's just that uh, sometimes you really would not expect like how how far they would take things <laughs> wow like like what did you have an example in, uh, in mind uh, like like recently we, we went full remote for example like we have like about six, uh, I think 6,000 people all over the world. And then they just suddenly, okay, everybody's gonna go remote because uh, they, Toby believes that uh, going rem- like working remotely is the, the way, is the, the way things will be in 2030. And then he just decided, okay, we're gonna be like, be, bring it forward. <laughs> and then now everybody like all of a sudden everybody is remote now but they but it's, it really lives up to how how Toby believes like the company should always be forward looking should be always ahead of the curve and all this stuff so yes. it was a very big decision to like everybody inside but some, the, but the, with the help of the the HR team we call it talent here mm. and then so they gave us a lot of support to help us type through this thing, which was like very impressive also. But this is one of the reasons like how, how far they really go to stick wow. to what they believe. Wow, that's amazing. That's really cool. <laughs> that's really, really cool. Where's the I, by the way, I really like your the trick you pulled to the last meetup with the fiber to mm. recreate the, enumer- the enumerator. That was really cool. Oh, thank you. <laughs> took me took me a while to twist my brain into that that that, that I, solution. I, I thought it was ingenious. I was like, wow! I was I would have never thought of fiber, but it makes sense. It's really good. Mm. Let me let me check where where the rest are. Usually people on this plate, not sure what's what's the reason this time round. Or am I not admitting people? Okay, let's let's start at seven forty. Let's sure. give them some time. Okay. Hello. Yes, yes, this is Hui Jing. Um, Hello. Yeah, uh, no, because I got this. Okay, let me explain. The talk CS, talk CSS setup also need to Zoom record. So then I, I, I use the other computer to OBS. Then I use this one. So I need two separate Zoom accounts. So I have a CSS account and a personal account. And oh. this computer happened to be the CSS account. And I was like, oh, oh, wait. Wrong. That's that's not that's that's not my face. But you know, yeah, fine. 
but now is uh is your top CSS still running now? Hmm, it's Monday, so we are first Wednesday every month. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I find this like first. I I always book the Ruby one to be the second Tuesday of every month. Ah, so yeah, I, easier, easier, really easier. Yeah, I found that like a reference like that then easier for people to remember. Correct. Also easier to coordinate with other people. Like the JS JS is middle, so they are like I think se- third. Uh. They are always the middle of the month. Uh. So they are, we are like mm. we won't clash one. Yeah. Mm. We'll never ever clash. <laughs> we got clash before last time when we started out and we never like say say properly then Clash already, then we're like, eh, hey, Clash and how? Then like, merch. Then we, we, had, we have a few merch ones. Because we're like, oh, oh uh, okay lah, merch lah. Because we are like, same one, right, Brian uh, Yeah. Okay lah, share audience. Everybody yeah, can. Yeah, 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 true, true. Our, our overlap is, uh, yeah, our overlap quite, quite overlap. Our Venn diagram quite close. So it's still like, quite, quite okay. Yeah, even the design of your logo is about the same. Ah, uh. uh, yeah lah. Cause yeah. actually, we, in in the official the official story is we spin off from them. We are like we are their sister. We are their sister meta. Cause they run mm. very long already. Then oh oh AWS tonight. Ah, no wonder. Oh, okay. No, like I I always like to make fun of the big meetup. So then I'm like, oh yeah yeah yeah. And then then the people who show like oh for the three of you who showed up instead of going to the for example. Instead of going to the Figma meetup, you came to my meetup. Thanks, thank you, three of you, that kind of thing. But like, it's <laughs> really like, Yeah, but Clash, Clash, Clash will be a one. It's actually okay, okay if we Clash with a non, like, I don't mind Clashing with the Haskell meetup because the Haskell people are never going to come to me. So like, oh yeah, hi, hi, hi. Like, you're not going, you're not, you're not from the Haskell group, but it's fine. Yeah, it's okay lah. Uh-huh. People uh-huh. will choose what? Where they want to go. Yeah, true. I haven't attended a Ruby meetup since 2016. <laughs> oh. It's okay. I'm a Ruby dev, but I don't. I only attended like two Ruby meetups before I start, I took over this thing. When did you take over? <laughs> no, wait, when did you take over? I took over the, about the start of this year. I think in February, something like that. Oh, so recent. Oh, okay. Yeah. And before that, I actually don't don't go for Ruby meetup. I always find it very tiring to go after work. <laughs> I uh, true lah, true lah, actually. Uh, so, but then, but then the Ruby meetup like died. Then I like, wow, so sad. Like, where are all the Ruby engineers? Yeah, like, okay, I do. But then now I think it's turning out well. If I do the online meetup, then I won't be so tired also, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think online online makes it easier for people to the people who always say uh, very very tired then don't go then is is I think it lower barrier to entry or so I guess. Yeah. Then I'm just gonna stick to online meetup. Then I, I also not so tired. <laughs> true, true, true. Yeah. Uh, okay lah. I think let's let's start. Although we don't have a lot of people today. But anyway, anyway, it's right. Got video means got me talk now. This guy King Ming tell me one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's recorded, so all these talks will go go up to Engineers SG right. after that, and and I think people do do go there and watch these videos on. Yes, yes. So... Engineers SG has fifteen k subscribers, so it's like yes, yes. <laughs> go audience, go audience. Let me, eh. Let me try and share. Oh no. I need to share screen. Oh, why is it so complicated? Can you press the green button? Yeah. Are you, but you, you own self recording. You're, you're, you're doing the recording yourself, is it? Uh, actually, I'm not. Uh, Michael, he started the recording and then he, he to like, made me a co host. He said he had something okay. else to record. But then, now that I'm the co-host, everything looks so complicated. Oh, um, so basically, share screen is the same. Uh, if he's the one controlling the recording, then you don't have to worry because it's already recording. Then you just run it as normal, never mind. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let me see whether this is the, the correct screen. Mm. Oh. 
Eh, I don't know why I cannot share. Uh, it says that uh, open security privacy to fund access. Uh, yeah, you, 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 you get out of Zoom first, you go to your system preferences and you allow, you, you, it's, a Katani, it's a Mac thing, you allow the pre okay. preferences, then you come back in. Yeah, so okay. since they updated the versions, everything's a mess with, with Zoom. Yeah, I've done this, I've done this so many times, I'm like, oh one yeah. One minute, one minute. Yeah, yeah. Take your time, take your time. Uh, can, I assign, can I assign you as a host? Okay, okay, okay. Assign, then you can take it back later. Yeah. Um, well, I guess he's permissioning himself. Hi. Um, <laughs> Nice to meet you, I guess. Nice I'm, you. I'm actually the organizer of the CSS meetup. Um, ah, nice. And I, I, I recently became uh, Kang Seng's colleague, like a month and a half ago. Um, okay, so, so you're, like, you're also working at, at Shopify then? Yes, yes. So I nice. uh, no Ruby or Rails experience. So I have to crash course. Um, but it's been good. Because Council has been working on the same project as me, and so basically he's just answering all my note questions. I'm like, how to render a template? What is <laughs> what is default content for? How do I put a variable? How do I yeah yeah basically how do I look a thing? Oh hi, he's back. Okay. That, that's the, that's life. Right? You gotta you gotta start somewhere. Yeah. I got I, you, if you'd get me outside of the basics of CSS, I also need to ask a lot of questions. <laughs> no, but, uh, okay. No, I'm biased. Can you give me the access to share my screen? Host disabled attendee screen sharing. Okay, hang on. Um, let's see. How do I pass this back to you? Security. Uh, no, not security. How did you make me a host? Ah? When I leave, then they ask me to choose something. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, in that case, I'm just gonna... Oh yeah, I can't really. I just made the host. Okay. Change host. Okay, got it. Yeah. Wow, this is like wow. play play Why continue is it still the same pass, thing? pass. It still show me the same thing. <laughs> huh? I'm sorry guys. Wait, let me I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh host disabled at the need. No, this one Michael needs to do something. This happened to me for CSS because I also cannot share. Okay, 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 okay. One but more I, time. I, one I more mean time. you the host though. One more time. Uh, I pass it back to you. One more time. Okay. Wait, if I'm the host, eh, I can share the screen though. You you can, you can, yeah. Okay, okay, wait. Uh, if I'm the host, I can... Security. I can... You have share screen under you? Allow participants to share screen. Where is yeah. he? He's wait, gone. <laughs> Oh man, come back. Cause, cause I turn it on now. <laughs> so if I give it back to him, he should be able to. Yeah. Okay, we just have to. <laughs> the perils of Zoom. Okay, to be fair, to be fair, we are not experienced with Zoom because uh, within our team we use Google Hangouts. Just say. Ah, uh, which works super well, by the way. Yeah, yeah. It works it's, it's really fun. well, actually. Mm. And it has this nice feature. I open, I open it up. You can, you, I open it up. You can share screen now. Then I give it back to you. Sorry. Okay. I was talking over you. Oh, wow. Why is it like that? You still don't have? <laughs> no, it still keeps asking me to open system preference, security privacy to go on like that. Uh, okay, okay, wait. Let me check which, which permission it was for me. Uh, security privacy. Open. Privacy screen recording is it? Yeah. Screen record. Yeah, you should give screen recording. But I already take everything. And let me see if you got anything else. Uh, through this access accessibility. Okay, I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, How about? A bit... No, microphone got camera got. Oh, is it accessibility? Whatever accessibility. I un I uncheck, but you can try, Kwa. Uh, I have the option to share my screen actually. No, he is Zoom. His is not a Zoom problem. His is an Apple problem. Let me see. Yeah. Can you I see can my screen? Oh, I can. I can. So weird. 
I don't know. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, um, there is an alternative. Do think... What do you need oh. your slides for? I just need to show the slide, actually. Oh, wait, so I have alternative. You can send us the link and then we show yeah. the slide over. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I actually have an alternative. I'm using some broadcasting system to show my uh uh camera feed so I can add my browser here. Display capture. Oh Winston is here. <laughs> Never mind he didn't miss much. So Uh can yes, um, we can see your telegram, so you probably don't want that <laughs> to be on screen. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, what's going what's going on? <laughs> uh Kang Sung's, I cannot share screen. Kang Sung's Mac doesn't let him share screen. Oh, it's not a Zoom thing, it's a Mac thing. Oh, uh, oh my god. I think you, you probably need to get out of he allowed permission to... already or just now he already really quit yeah. and come back. Really? Uh? Yeah. Okay. Wait. Uh. Just a bit more. <laughs> Just a bit more. Just a bit more, I'm sorry. Let me change to get pin his image, eh? pin video. Uh, okay. We're almost there. We're almost there. Okay. Got now, got now. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, I cannot see myself now. But okay, let's go with this. <laughs> cross, cross. Yay. Okay. Uh, yeah, so today, I think it'll be a very, uh, the, this is the schedule for today, we only have two talks, so it's, uh, it's as usual, the schedule, sponsored shout out, and all the rest, wrapping around the two talks. So the first one is uh, Miguel, Miguel and Prima, uh, talking about scraping with food traffic. Um, so, okay, before that, so... Uh, then again, I, I want to thank Michael for hosting uh, our Ruby meetup session and recording uh, again. Like for the, he has been helping us for the past uh, few meetups. So like, thank you. And then, uh, I don't know whether you all know yet, uh, we have a Ruby SG Telegram channel. Uh, so please join uh, if you haven't. Okay, and then uh, I will skip this one. So today's talk, uh, Prima is not here, uh, unfortunately. So we only have Miguel uh, talking about uh, going through this presentation. So food traffic, uh, to, he'll be showcasing the food traffic jam uh, and it's a wrapper for Ferrum, designed to run website testing and script information off website. So this jam is uh, released in Adler Wagon. So they're here to get some feedback. Uh, yeah, so Miguel, do you want to give uh, I pass over the time to you? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm gonna go and share my screen. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Okay, so I'm gonna go to my desktop, and if I click on present, can you still see it well? Yes, yeah, looks, looks okay. Okay, so hey, thank you very much for the presentation and for the introduction. We're going to talk about scraping with food traffic and another gem called Vessel. And the reason for that is because we see options for food traffic to be connected in some way with Vessel. So that's why we're going to showcase it so we can get the feedback from the community. About us, uh, I'm Miguel. I'm the product manager slash business guy for Levagon Singapore. We're a coding school. We run a coding bootcamp in Singapore for the last year and a half. And um, Prima, who's one of our senior developers and lead teachers, uh, has prepared a lot of the work that you're going to see today. But unfortunately, because of an urgency, he cannot be with me. So I hope I can represent him in, to the best of my ability. Um, the talk of, about, about the talk today, we're going to talk very quickly about what is scraping in case anybody here doesn't really know what it is or it's just a term that they've never heard. Uh, we're gonna talk about, uh, give an overview of some of the scraping choices that you have in Ruby. And then we're gonna talk more in depth about food traffic and vessel. I'm gonna do a quick live demo that I hope it takes most of the 30 minutes that I have. And then I'm of course very happy to take any questions from you guys. And now that we're in smaller groups, it's also more intimate. Uh, is that okay? Any questions before I get started? No. Okay. Let's go. So scraping, basically uh, transforming 
data that isn't structured from all over the web, that it's presented in layouts and in browsers, and you cannot really compute or manipulate or aggregate it anyway. You have an application layer where your web scraping software lives. You can access through any sort of interface. You can access the website, get the information, and make it structured. And then you can either dump it into a database, you can dump it into an Excel, into JSON, your CSV, or any format of your choice. So this is basically what, what scraping is about. Why should you care about it and why is it important? It's uh, extremely useful if you're data mining. So if you are, uh, let's say, um, a recruitment agency and you're looking for profiles all over the web and all over LinkedIn, then you can use scraping to get a lot of data into your product quickly. Growth hacking, if you're looking for contacts, if you're looking for people, for customers, and different listings, and you can you just want to automate the task of looking through emails, looking for people that you can actually address. Also very important for competitive research or price monitoring. So uh, retailers, supermarkets, airlines are, are using scraping all the time to look at what other competitors are pricing and that feeds into their own pricing algorithm. So that's, that's the power of scraping and there's big, businesses or big companies built on only on the on the notion of scraping um, some things to consider if you're scraping around and i didn't know some of this not too long ago so this uh, you can actually be in trouble scraping public data may be legal like depending on the country depending on the domain depending on the website could be illegal so you need to inform yourself uh, you Almost never in almost any country, you're never allowed to use data that you scrape for and claiming that as it, as it is yours. So if you're using, let's say, blog posts or anything like that to inject it in your, into your own content, that doesn't work. If you break a website because you overload it through scraping, you can be prosecuted and you can get up to 10 years of jail in some countries. And th these regulations are more great than black and white it, it depends a lot on the use case so be informed just to stay safe if you're scraping around make sure that there's no api before scraping if you can use an api instead of scraping of course it's a better option make sure that you look at robots txt on the website and that gives you guidance on what is scrapable what not at what times what what do they prefer what do they not prefer how to identify yourself as somebody who's scraping and they can realize that you're not a uh, harmful agent. Uh, make sure that when you're crawling through a website, you set a conservative crawl rate. So you kind of ping in the website every one, two seconds, and you're just not overloading their servers. Declare your intentions again in the user agent part. So you, they know what you're up to and who you are. And if you're thinking of a really massive crawling practice, a crawling project, it's maybe sound to get a lawyer involved and, and distill these complexities of what is legal, what is illegal, so you're, you're always safe no matter what you're doing. So that on scraping, um, what, can, what do we have available to us in Ruby to scrape? Uh, well, we have a number of things, some more known, some less known. One of the most known is of course Nogogiri, which is kind of your, your starter jump into, into scraping and you just basically get the HTML and you can start playing with it. And a very popular one is of course Selenium, not only for scraping, but also for integration testing, uh, automation tasks. And you also have Mechanize, which is kind of Nokogiri on asteroids. They didn't have a logo, but it's also uh, maintained by Aaron Patterson, Tenderlove. So I felt like putting that picture over there to representing was the best thing I could do for him and for us. And we also have Ferrum, which is a relatively new gem created by a studio that it's on the tip of my tongue right now, but I'll, I'll show you guys later. It's a, it's a famous Ruby agency. doesn't come right now into my mind, damn it. But basically why I'm showing, why I'm showcasing two gems that are built on Ferrum today, both um, foot, foot traffic and vessel, they're both built on, on top of Ferrum. It's because it's really fast. Uh, it's, uh, when, when you benchmark it against Selenium, it really wins. So it's, it's really, really good. Um, it has a wider API surface if you use it for Chrome. So since Selenium is compatible with almost every browser that it's around there, their API surface and the things that the ways that you can interact with the browser are more reduced compared to what you can do with Ferrum since it only uses Chromium. And it the way it's built, it reminds you a lot of the way Puppeteer in, works, if you're familiar with Puppeteer in JavaScript. But of course, since it's Ruby, the syntax is a little bit simpler. 
and you can also perform JS evaluation on it directly. So if, if you have a JS script that you want to see, or you have a, a number of JavaScript, be, a, a set of JavaScript behaviors that you want to evaluate against the browser, you can do it in Ferrum, and that's pretty cool. And it's multi-thread and thread safety. So you can basically run lots of different tabs in parallel. And if you are running something with WebSockets, for instance, and you have different users interacting with the database, you can have it, you can test it on different threads and see how that reflects in the way you're using it, and it, it works really nicely. So those are kind of the, the advantages of Ferro. And foot traffic, which is the gem, one, of, one of the gems that we're showcasing today, it's a DSL for Ferro. Like it's, it's just a wrapper that allows you to structure sessions more effectively. So you can see an example over there where you could just basically just require foot traffic, you get a, a session, and then you can start creating new, new tabs and start playing with that behavior. Also, uh, there's a little bit of a, a syntactical sugar that you can use just to go to websites or use nav or navigate around and in interact with the website. That's something that we'll see later in the demo. And if you want to scrape seriously and you just don't want to get like just some data from a website, you just want to do a, a serious scraping operation, then you have Bessel, which is also built on, on top of Ferrum and it works really well. This is kind of the basic way it works. You need a class, you need to set a domain, a number of start URLs. It's also thread safe, so you can have several URLs at the same time to start with. And then you need a parse method where you basically declare what is the selector that you want to get out of the website. And then you can get that data out and throw it somewhere else. And then you just basically run it with, with the run method and a block that will be consumed by the parse method later on. So, so that on the gems, um, about foot traffic, the way it's built right now, it's, it's open source. We, we haven't, it's, a very, it's in a very early stage, so the possibilities are big. But for now, it's not meant for pure automated testing. It's not supposed to work along our spec, and it's not supposed to be taking care of that side of your application. If you're interested in using Ferrum for that as well, there's another gem called Cuprite that you can play, that plays along very nicely with KB Bearer for that. Foot traffic is mostly designed for low, like pressure testing your application and seeing how it works when, when you, you wanna see how behavior plays around life. If you're using a framework like a Stimulus Reflex or using WebSockets and you wanna see how a use case actually plays out when a human is playing with it in the closer way, in the closest way to it, it would, as a human would be interacting with the website, then um, foot, foot traffic is a very good option for that. But it's not right yet for automated testing. You can run small scraping scenarios, but it's still not optimized for that yet. That's something that we would like to add a wrapper to Vessel to in the future. That's why we want your feedback. So if you see that there's any potential, you're curious about the gem and you want to try it out, you want to raise a PR, please be our guest, we, we're very keen to improve it. And um, these are some of the links. I can throw them later on the chat if, you, if you're if you interested in it. I'm, I'm very happy to copy paste in so you can just go directly to all the gems that I've been talking about. Um, any, any questions before we go into the live code? Anything on the chat? Not really. Nope. All right, all right, then let's get started. Let me just get out of here. Uh, let me clear this thing. So, and let me go into Sublime and move all the stuff that I have around here. So this is foot traffic first, and we're just gonna simulate how to scrape this site, which is a site meant for scraping. I'm just gonna go to it for a second. And basically they have a sandbox of examples where you can just play around with scraping without risking yourself that you're in a scraping a website that you're not supposed to scrape. So it's, it's very good at, as, a, as a sandbox for for beginners. Uh, we're gonna be looking at how to use foot traffic. We, we're gonna be testing two scenarios, how to run a login 
So something like that, I, don't, I mean, we cannot see it over here right now. Sandbox, script this side, sandbox. This one on the hockey teams, we're gonna be scraping this table over here. And there's another one that tests if you are a user that needs authentication, but doesn't quite show right now. Let me, I have the, the URL over here. So let me just bring it over. So this is just simulates that you don't need to log in and you need to put any, any username and any password in order, in order to go, go forward, right? So this is the two scenarios that we're gonna try out with food traffic. Um, you, in the moment you start with food traffic and, and you have the gem install, you get access to session and start. And this method takes a hash of options that allows you to set some stuff to set to stay safe. So the process timeout, if you want to make sure that all the resources are loaded and before taking any action. So I have it at 10 seconds max. If otherwise it keeps moving a timeout, if nothing happens at all, you have a slow-mo. If you want to simulate actions with a little bit more time and at what resolution you want to display the window. And there's a, a number of other options that I will show some others, some other um, attributes later on, but basically I get a window object over here. So I can just say window uh, tab thread and I can open a block and that gives me access to a tab object. And over here, basically I can just hold the tab and go to, a, go to an address. And that is gonna basically just zoom on the website. After that, I can just go into the tab and use method like CSS to get all the elements that respond to a particular selector or add CSS to get the first one. I can do the same with add XPath or XPath if I just want something that it's a little bit more specific or in, in case the, the structure of the website, it's made a little bit more, they've obfuscated the, the CSS and the classes. So um, let's try that out before we go here. Let's just run the script. Run, and I can go to get one start. And that gives me the login, right? So over here, I can just basically explore what are the attributes of the things. So I have an input for type text and I have the password. So I can go at that CSS with the name user that you see over there, back into the code. And then over, once I have selected that, I can type and I can chain actions and type. So I could say something like my name, I could put comma, after that I can just click on a particular action that I want uh, on a key, something like tab or enter. So I can just say tab to move to the password. I can put pass, I think it responds to basically anything. And after that I can click enter. So if now I rerun my script, Hopefully it selects it and there's something that went wrong. Of course, live coding, nothing's gonna go as you wanted it to go. Did I save the file? I went, go into the file, tap thread. Okay, I think I'm missing, I know what I'm missing. I need to focus on the element and then I'm ready to type. Sorry about that. So now you can see, and there's a little bit of time passing between the actions. And then I successfully logged in, right? So it, it's nice if you wanna 
play with, uh, with, with your application and see how it actually responds to you. And the good thing is that you can also open different threads and different tabs at the same time. So I can do another tab thread and do something different. And for instance, maybe I want to go to the other place where I, I have the, the forms and the, the teams that I was showcasing for the hockey teams. And let's just run it. So you can see like the two tabs are opening at the same time and this is running well this is working so basically what I want over here is to look for a team and get maybe all the wins for a given team across the year right? so if I want the Boston Bruins I could look for Boston And I get all the, the Boston Bruins and I can get all the data. And maybe I just want the wins. So I want to simulate that behavior with the traffic. To do that, I basically need to target this first. So now I have name Q. I can go back into the code. And over here, I have the same tab. And at the CSS with that identifier, I can focus and I can type just Boston and then enter. I can then just for safety sleep a bit to make sure that um, if there's any JavaScript that activated in the moment of that search, it doesn't interfere in the next action because maybe the slow mo is just a little bit too late, too, not, not enough. And then I could just select the table that I have over there. And then I could iterate from that table and basically just run a, a bunch of CSV to get it into this file that I have over here. So basically, let me delete that. I think my blocks are working well. But uh, as you can see, um, here's where you can see that food traffic is not perfect for scraping just yet because I, I need to start running loops. I, I don't have a lot of methods. I don't have embedded classes that I can build on, but I can still do the work somehow. So basically over here, what I'm doing, I'm, um, I'm appending to a CSV. I'm accessing the, the rows within that table that I got over here, which is basically um, this table on the hockey teams. I want to get all these rows and I'm just getting the I'm just getting this name and I'm getting their wins. And I'm doing that with add path in this case when I'm going through the rows instead of with that at CSC. And then on the CSV I'm just throwing the team names and the wins. So if now I close and I run it, fingers crossed it works. <clears throat> goes to the website you can see that that behavior is going over there while that is working uh, hopefully the scraping happened can go to data csv and no it didn't load unfortunately try again i had this issue before i wonder if it's a matter of this so let's run it once again otherwise we move to the next case There we go, now I got it. So it was just sleeping. And now I just successfully parsed the data. So, so that is um, how a, a little bit of how food traffic works. Um, you can go into the documentation if you're interested. 
this is another good thing that it, it, it leaves your browser open so you can keep playing with stuff once you're done running the, the test case or the scenario. And it has some really nice documentation on how to, how to play with it. So, so that's foot traffic. Um, going back to the slide set, I just wanted to show as well Bessel. which is basically um, an, a, different, a different way of working. It's a, a proper gem meant to scrape websites. And the way it works, we have the case two over here. You need to start a class that you can call scraper or spider or banana, anything you want, but it needs to inherit from Bessel and Cargo. You need a domain, you need a set of start URLs, and you need a parse method. So we're gonna be looking at um, Deliveroo and we're gonna parse, uh, we're gonna scrape some information from the restaurants. By the way, if you check the robots TXT, it's absolutely clean. Like you, you are allowed to scrape Deliveroo at any time. They have no restrictions. <coughs> so basically what I need is Deliveroo on the domain and the start URL that I'm gonna get is this one. I'm gonna get restaurants from Singapore and I'm gonna pass two arguments on the terminal later on so I can just customize which CD I want and what postal code I want. Just so you get an idea of what I'm going to scrape. It's over here. That is exactly the, the URL that I'm, that I'm looking at. I'm gonna play with this parameter, is coast. That could be Novena, could be anything else and the postal code in Singapore. And I'm gonna try to get the information from this card. Like you can see over here that it's, it's really obfuscated and this is something that maybe firm is not gonna be great at, but over here I, I can play with the expats until I get what I really want. Basically what I'm trying to get is this. I, I have some information on the restaurant and it's hidden on an area label for accessibility, but this is the info that I want. So. Basically, I'm going to get that start URL, which I already copy pasted. Yes. I'm going to start the parse method. And in this parse method, the first thing that I need is a, is a selector. I get the same thing as uh, since it, this is powered by firm, and so you can use XPath or you can use. CSS for select, I'm just gonna use XPath. And um, this is the thing that I need. I know that I need this because whenever I go to this element in particular and I copy the, the, the full XPath, this is exactly what, what it leads me. So the developer tools kind of help me out in getting a really complex query done. And then for each of these, if I did add XPath, it will give me just one, but I want all of them. So I'm going through all of them. And on each of these, I'm going to get the name, distance, rating of the category by manipulating a little bit of the information that I get under that area label and splitting it. And then I'm just going to call a yield block. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to pass a yield, that will be returning the name, the rating, and the distance in, in, a, ha in a hash for me. So this is all I need to start scraping. Now to, I, need to start the, I need to store my information somewhere so I can just say maybe choices. This could be an empty array. And then I can run my scraper. And then scraper.run takes a block that needs to be consumed by parse later on. So over here, I just say resto, which is what I'm using um, within the choices. I throw the resto. And maybe I can just display them on the terminal. So with this, if everything works out, I can now 
to Ruby case to start and I can pass East Coast and I think this is my postal code and hopefully this works. Nice, so I just get the information over here for all the restaurants that I'm passing. So that on, on Vessel, just so you guys know, both um, support kind of good, they have good features for stress testing. So um, here on the options that you can also pass on, on Vessel, I can use stuff like cloning. So I could just simulate how 100 browser apps would be doing this at the same time to see how my, my application would work under stress. And I could also um, just run it on headless, which are also good, good things to know. So, so yeah, um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got curious. Um, we're very excited to know about what, what you know, if you wanna raise a PR, if you wanna be, if you wanna learn more about the food traffic and, and Ferrum and, and the scraping ecosystem, well, we're definitely very excited about it. Now we're using food traffic and the Levagon product to run some of the simulations, not, as I said, no integration testing, but really to see how some of the JavaScript and the sprinkles of JavaScript that they have, we have on the front end are working. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to having your feedback. Um, just uh, one thing more, just to close before saying thank you. If you're hiring Ruby or Ruby on Rails dev developers, we are creating new ones every two, three months. So please feel free to contact us. And if you enjoy teaching or you enjoy mentoring or you enjoy getting involved with people who are giving their first steps in programming, uh, people like this, some of them are, like I think two of them are Singaporean and they transformed their careers with us. Now they're, they're developing and they're, they're working as Rails developers in, in Singapore. Uh, please, please get in touch with me. Um, you can partner with us in hiring events and job posting. You can bring you our students to do capstone projects. You can be a teacher for us, full-time, part-time, do workshops, um, be a speaker, whatever you want. That's my contact. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening. Any, uh, okay. any, any questions? Uh, I have a question. Vessel and food traffic are both APIs for Ferrum. Sorry, is it something like that? They're all they're both built on top of Ferrum. Yeah. Mm, okay. Uh, then I'm curious, like, uh, what is the reason you guys built food traffic? We wanted a DSL that was a little bit more comfortable for, for doing the threading. So this particular behavior that we have over here, it's a, it's a little bit more com, com, convoluted when you're just using Ferrum plainly. And that's why we started doing food traffic. Also, we need to do a lot of scraping work for, uh, for growth hacking purposes. And we wanted to start using our own solution and, and we really like Vessel, but there's some, some stuff that we think food traffic could build on top. And that's where we're going with this. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Um, I'm, I haven't done a lot of uh, web scraping, just a little bit. But I can, definitely can tell that this is uh, easier to use than Selenium. Definitely. The uh, syntax looks cleaner and it's more straightforward. So, yeah, this is what I can see from your presentation. Nice. Well, I'm glad that at least that came across that it's, uh, it's usable. Okay, cool. anybody sure else have any feedback? I'm going to throw the links on the chat. For those that are curious.
Okay. Um, yeah, if nobody have any questions. Anybody else have any feedback or questions? Uh, if not, then uh, thank you, Miguel, for your sharing today. Oh, thank you. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, then shall we continue? Uh, a, okay. So I'm going to continue to use my camera as my, as my screen sharing tool. Uh, you guys, you don't mind. Then. Okay. Cool. Uh, uh, let me know if you guys cannot see my screen because this is not uh not the norm for me. I'm using my camera to share. Uh, okay. Then the next talk is uh from me. Actually, this is not like super Ruby, but um, I'm just gonna talk about JSON Web Tokens, and there will be a small part to teach you like how how we can use uh JWTs in Ruby. But the gist, the main part of the talk is actually uh, understanding, it's more of the conceptual level uh, of like what is JWT and what is it used for. Um, yeah, so uh, let me get my slides. Okay, I hope you guys can see mm, because I cannot see. I cannot see anything related to Zoom. Uh, eh? Why is it so slow? I can I see lagging? it. Uh, you're lagging Am a I bit. Lagging? You're lagging a bit, but I can see it. Uh, okay, I. Okay, everything is not going well today. <laughs> okay, so I, I just gonna start my talk. Uh, so today again, I'm gonna talk about JWT, and then uh, just a disclaimer that this topic. Uh, actually can get very deep but all the details and examples in this presentation are pretty basics should be good enough to get you started but I'm but I'm sure you will be able to go deeper into uh, all the algorithms and all the stuff to to beef up your JWT implementation okay so the first thing is what are JWTs so JSON web tokens is actually an open standard uh, with this number RFC 7519 and then the standard is actually for securely securely transmitting data between two parties using the JSON object uh, JavaScript object notation which is, which is JSON so you can find the RFC the official RFC uh, details in this website uh, yeah, and then you will see a very old school website detailing all the all the standards. Okay, so a trivial example of how a JWT can be used because it's supposed to be used to securely transmit data, right, between two parties. So I have an example here is John. John wants to tell Roland something, right, and then John can create a JWT with some data, and then he can pass to Roland. And Roland can read the data and and also verify that the data is not tampered with. So then uh, the question is like how how can Roland read and also verify the integrity of the 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 data that was given to him by John? So this is the main main question today. Uh, how to securely transmit data. Okay. So let's go through the structure of a JWT. So a JWT is actually like three, has three parts uh, uh, separated by two dots. So the first, the part that is in front of the first dot is actually called the header. Then the middle part is called the payload. And then the last part is called the signature. Okay, so let's go through them one by one. Firstly, the header of the JWT, which is the first part before the dot. Interestingly, actually, this is just a base 64 URL encoded data of the, we call it metadata of this token. It's like a HTTP header like that. It's a metadata. And this metadata, it, it just outlines, or it just tells you how to read the token. How do you read the, 
how to read this JWT. So for example, if we do a base 64 uh, URL decoding of the header, we will just get a JSON. Algorithm is HS256. You just say uh, that is the algorithm that is used to use to encode this token. And then the type is JWT. So by because this is JWT, so this this type will always be JWT. I have no idea why they specifically put this type here, since this standard is for JWT, but then this is like a standard. Okay. So so is anybody can if anybody get hold of this token, they can just like split the token by the dot get the first part and then they run the base 64 url decoding and then they will be able to understand how to read this token okay so the second part is the payload which is the middle part of the jwt which is actually also a base 64 url encoded message of uh, that john wants to tell roland this time around is literally the message that john wants to tell roland so if you have any message that you want to send over via JWT, right, you should be putting inside uh, here. So, so after URL, base 64 URL decoding, this uh, payload, we, will, we, we can see that what John wants to tell uh, Roland actually, so he has a subject, it's like an email like that. So the subject is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, then the, the name is, his name is John Doe. He just wants to tell Roland that his name is John Doe. And it's issued at a timestamp. So it just tells John, uh, tells Roland that when did he send this message. So the middle part, this payload is also a basically for URL, URL encoded of the message. And then the last part is actually the signature. So this is the most uh, important part of the token. And this is not basically for you are encoded. So, so this is this last part of the this signature of the JWT is actually a hash generated using uh, uh, using ba the the base sixty four encoded of the header plus a dot plus a base sixty four encode of the payload, and then sign with the with a secret, which only in this case, because John is creating the token, right? So he can use his secret to sign. So in this very trivial example, uh, let's say John and Roland have a secret that they share. So, so John can sign with this secret. And then Roland, on the other hand, can, uh, can decrypt. Oh, John can encrypt with this secret. And then John can decrypt with the same secret because they share the secret, right? So this is how this is how Roland will be able to check the integrity of the of the payload of this JWT, whether somebody go and tamper with it or not. Okay. So so this is an example of how you can prevent man in the middle with a JWT. Preventing man in the middle. Basically, it just says that uh, like to maintain the integrity of the token. So for example, you have a hacker and a hacker uh, somehow got your token, got, got John's token. It's like a postman. So like the postman got the letter and then in the middle, he can do whatever he wants before he gives to Roland, right? So if, if the postman got hacker banned, he got the token, he cannot change the payload without uh, screwing up the signature because the signature is dependent on the header and the payload. So if any of these things change, the signature will, will change. So, so the first thing is hacker band cannot change the payload uh, without the signature, the integrity check using the signature failing. Neither can you change the header without the integrity check of the using the signature to fail too. So all in all, because Hacker Ben doesn't know the secret that is shared in between John and Roland, he, can, he wasn't able to generate a new signature after he changes the payload or the header. So that is how uh, you can 
how JWT maintains the integrity of the of the token. Okay, so I'm gonna go to this website to show you an example of uh, how this integrity thing plays around. So, uh, so, so this is a secret. Okay, it is my very very secret. Okay, my very secret secret. Sorry, my very secret secret. Okay. And then this is the header, right? And then this is the payload. So the signature is actually generated by this base64 URL encoded of the header with a dot and the base64 encoded payload. And then sign with this secret here. Okay. So for example, I'm hacker band, then all I see is this. And I want to change like uh change. The, the header a bit. So from E, maybe I want to change to R. Then I can see that then now it fails the signature. Uh, yeah, so no choice, cannot change. Then try to change uh, change the payload to Z or to X. Then it still fails the signature. So cannot change also. So there's no way, no way hacker band can change this token without failing the integrity check unless he has the secret so if he has the secret he can change any of this data and then resign the signature with the secret that he also found out then that is the only way to to be able to uh, attack uh, or to change this token change the message that john wants to tell roland yeah so 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 if you if you are very into this encryption stuff, you will realize that or oh, maybe sharing a secret uh is not uh, is not the best idea. Like uh, Roland and John share this same secret, then then you can bring in all your like public uh public private key uh encryption and all these encryption like ideas into this token. But basically the idea, but basically the integrity check is that. One side can sign sign the token and issue it out. The other side will be able to check using this signature. Yeah. So, so this topic on uh, then the, on this part you can go very deep. So that one you can go and explore on your own. Okay. But the idea is this: this JW this is how JWT maintains integrity. Okay. So the next part is then oh, now we know the concept. How can we use do it in Ruby? So uh, actually, there's a Ruby gem called JWT, uh, which is a Ruby implementation of this standard that we mentioned. Okay, so any anything that you can find in the standard, you can is implemented in this gem. So anything you want to do there that you see on the standard that you want to do, you will be able to find a method uh, to do it in this gem. Okay, so so. With regards to JWT, actually, there's only two main things. You just want to encode and you just want to decode. Encoding is for John. John can encode and send the JWT out. Decoding is for Roland to be able to read, to get the JWT and then decode and check whether, uh, check whether is the integrity is uh, still there and then to understand what is the data inside. Okay, so, so the encoding is pretty simple. You just need to put a payload, the message that you want to send to, John wants to send to Roland, and then put the key, put a key uh, that is supposed to be your shared secret that you, that you use to uh, encrypt, the, to create the signature. Then you can also choose a algorithm that you want to encrypt uh, with. So here by default, it's HS256. I also not I'm also not a very ex, not an expert on all this encryption algorithm, but I just know that there's many many types. So, uh, likewise in this gem they offer many types of encryption too. So you can go there and check, uh, pick which one if you want to use if you are if you can tell the difference. And then, uh, by default it's HS two five six, and then um, you can put some additional header fields other than the default uh that was 
shown just now, the type is JWT and something else which I cannot remember. Okay, so, so in this example on the right, um, after we run the JWT.encode, you can see that, oh, okay, then it's a JWT that is, uh, that is the output, which is also, if you look closely, there's two dots. So it's also split into three parts. Okay. So this is encode, creating a JWT in Ruby. Then the next part is, then given this same token, then how do you decode it? You can also use the same JWT uh, gem. So the first few, you just pass in, put in the entire uh, JWT. Then the key, you're supposed to put in the, the decoding key also, the shared secret that you want to decode with here. And then, uh, and then this verification, actually, uh, in this standard, there's more than just checking the signature. You also can check uh, whether, the, whether the, the token is expired. That you can have some rules. You can, you can put in some rules to check uh, whether to put in like, more validation rules for this token. So that one, uh, you will put, it, put a true or false here whether you want to check all these rules or so. Then on the right, you can see that if you pass in the token on the code, then uh, it returns you the message. Yeah, so, so this is how you can decode a JWT in Ruby. So actually, I'm just like telling you how to use this gem. There's only two, two main methods. And then what are the other things that you can do with this gem, which is also comes from, from the RSD? is you can have many types of claims. Like just now I mentioned expiry claim. You also can put in like not before claim. So it's not valid if, it's not valid if, if the, the token is, bef is, you got the token before a specific time that John like uh, stated. Or you can have a issue at claim then uh, then you can determine, like for example, if John issue two hours ago, then you don't want to accept any token that is two hours old. Then at this point in time, you can use the issue at claim tool to like say that the token is not valid. So of course, there's a lot of other claims. You can go and take a look inside the RFC. Uh, it'd be interesting because some, uh, like you, you will have a use case for all these claims to make your beef up your JWT implementation. So, so now that we have talked about uh, talk about JWT, right? It's just a token. It, it now it's just a token that can transmit data securely between two persons. Uh, then what what can you use for? So a very basic use case is actually authentication. Okay, so I have a me I have a small diagram here about how you can use a JWT to uh, do authentication. So for example, you have your API server on your left side and then you have the user mobile phone maybe on the right side or a browser on the right side. So when you when a user signs in, then you check whether the username and password is correct or not from your database records. And then if it's correct, you can issue a a JWT using your and sign with your own server secret. And then you what you can put inside is you can put the user ID equals to one and then you can put an expiry claim to say that this J, JWT is only valid for two hours. Then you send the token back to the user device. Uh, so the user's mobile phone or the browser. And then subsequent calls uh, this, this user can make subsequent calls using the JWT that the server gave him, give him or her, okay? So in this case, the user can do uh, to look up profile, its own profile data, okay? So because the user cannot edit the JWT, right? So when the user send the JWT along with the request to the API server, the, the server will try and decode with the We'll try to check the integrity of the token with the, the, the key that he, the server created the token with. Okay, so if you can decode properly integrity intact, right, then the, the server should be able to trust 
the user ID equals to one. Like the ID is not changed. Because if it's changed, then the token will be invalid already. So then the server will be able to just use the user ID to look up the user data and then send back uh, and then send the data back to the user device. So basically this JWT can be trusted. Okay. And then for example, two out 2.5 hours later, and then the user device try to request data using the same JWT. Then of course the server will be able to decode the the token, but then by checking the expiry claim, then the JWT is not valid anymore. And the then the server can just tell the user that oh this token is not valid anymore. You have to then the server then the user will have to get a new token somehow. Maybe just sign in again to get the token again. Yeah. So this is a simple example of how how you can uh, use JWT to, to do authentication because the token uh, can, you can validate the integrity of the token. Okay, so of course, authentication is slightly more complex uh, than this. This is like more like an API authentication. So of course, it's slightly more com complex, uh, but then the, this is the general idea uh, how you can use JWT to pass around. So, so of course, um, some people uh, will pass more information than just user. Maybe you can pass permissions. So like now you issue this permission, this use this token has permissions to uh, do this do ABC. Then as long as this token is valid, they, the user can use this token to do ABC. Yeah. So. Uh, there are a lot of resources to read online. And then I know that there are many libraries that, that, uh, that like for example, device, device is a very popular authentication like Ruby uh, authentication gem, but it doesn't use JWT. But I know that there's a plugin with device JWT to make you do, be able to do authentication with JWT. Yeah. So, uh, there are many libraries, so you can go and take a look. Uh, I'm not very sure. I only know that they exist because I just used the idea and just wrote my own uh, or my own use case. Yeah, so uh, just some simple summaries. So JWT is actually a very simple idea. It's just a, a way to pass message while maintaining integrity. So like it's not limited to authentication. It's, you have any ideas that you think that you need, uh, you need uh, the message integrity to be there, then, then you'll be able to use this, like make it work for your use case. And then it's very lightweight. Uh, another good thing is very lightweight because it's just like a string, right? Just some characters. Uh, maybe I think got 100 characters, but that's about it. Yeah. And then the next thing that is very, very good is it can be generated, this, this, uh, this token is generated on the fly. So you must, you can, like when the user needs it, then you will call, then you call and code with blah, 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 all the information. And then you generate there and then, and then you can just send it out. You don't need to save anything uh, on your server, on your database. Okay, then the next thing is, it actually can let you encode like a lot of information. There's no limit to what, what message that you can encode, right? So you can encode a lot, a lot of information and send it over at one go, like in one, in one, uh, in one, what, uh, what do you say? In one token, uh, yeah. So um, some, some people, when some, some, like for example, if I bring up the use case of permissions, like the very olden days of way of doing it is like, you have a table with you tag uh, permissions and then you have, uh, a ID, a user ID tag to a set of permissions inside the database. Then when you look, then when the user requests for something, you will check what is the user ID. Then you look up the database to check whether the user got this permission. Then if you have the permission, then you can, then you let the person do the thing. You don't have permission, you can, then you let the person, then you don't let the person do that thing. But in this case, actually, you can save the looking up the permissions in the database. Because the token is issued with the permissions inside the token, you can trust that the permissions are 
inside the token is correct. So when the user requests to do something, you decode the you decode the token, you check, oh, permission is there. Then you immediately can let the person do the thing. You don't even need to go to the database to look up. So this is uh, one example of how you can save your uh, resourcing. Okay. But this very, very, but this last point is the most important part is that do not ever encode sensitive information because the header and the, the header and the payload is actually just base64 URL encoded. So for example, permissions is not sensitive. You can, you can uh, let people read, it doesn't matter. Like user ID, you let people read, it doesn't matter. As long as they cannot break into your system to get any information. But if you have like credit card number, then that one, save it inside the database. Don't put it inside the, the, don't put it inside the token. So uh, even if they, even if you have to read up the database to get that, get that uh, credit card number, so be it, because this is so sensitive, right? So sensitive information, don't, don't put it inside the token. Yeah. So uh, these are some of the resources that I have uh, gone through. Oh, I think it's helpful for this topic. Um, yeah. I think, yeah. So, so it's a very interesting idea. It's a very, very simple idea, but it, it's a very, very powerful uh, concept. So I hope you learned something new today. And yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you, Matt. Okay, anybody got any questions? Sorry for the recursion. <laughs> <laughs> uh okay i think yeah i think that's about it for today thank you man yeah. i got i implemented gwt once and i mm. really i didn't really have any idea what was going on so i, I oh. was just just using the library and, and making it work but i i have no idea of the logic that was going on behind and the thinking so thank you for explaining that welcome okay so there's only three people here, right? Uh, not sure whether anybody will... <laughs> then whether it's helpful to even do any job shout out. <laughs> okay. And then, um, yeah. So the next meetup is... Oh, oh, I didn't update this. Okay. It's actually July 2nd, uh, 2nd Tuesday. But then uh, not confirmed yet. Our... But I created a meetup event already, so I might I might change uh, it. But I'll update again. Okay. So as usual, uh, for Huizing and Miguel, if you if you haven't joined our Telegram group, uh, please go ahead. And then yeah, that's the end of the meetup. Um, thank you very much, Miguel, for speaking, and thank you for, pleasure. for coming. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Hope to see you guys again. Indeed, uh, indeed, indeed. Yes. Thank you, thank you for organizing and and, and keeping the meetup together, keeping the, the Ruby community together. Oh, come. Okay, that's it. Thank you, thank Yay. you, Michael, for recording also. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.